not here tonight in this room at 9 p.m. So people interested. So the next uh, speaker is Sonia Lambert from King's College. Okay. Uh, Okay. All right. Right. Well, of course, I'd like to very much thank the organisers uh, for the opportunity to talk about my work. Of course, uh, when I say my work, it's my work with these collaborators, with John Bagger, uh, and I wrote these series of papers with, and then there's one written by David Tom, uh, David Tom, that I'd like to talk about as well. During uh, the talk, I'll also mention uh, some of the work done by other people, uh, it's probably only in passing. Uh, there's been quite a lot of work done, so I, I, I apologize to people who are It's not a time for anything. So, uh, I guess I've given this, some of this talk a few times, and I always thought the line end brains are mysterious objects. And that's certainly true. Um, so, in the case of a single end theory brain, uh, the full supersymmetric dynamics have been known for quite some time. Uh, and, and even they themselves, if you combine them with, say, the uh, duality with type 2a string theory, can convey, uh, have some very powerful and, and sometimes even magical properties. So the M2 brain itself was first written down by Boshoff, Saskin, and Townsend like 20 years ago. Um, and then it took another 10 years for people to work out the uh, action or the, at least the equations of motion, perhaps more specifically, uh, for the M5 brain. And it's a single brain. So, of course, the general principle is that it's a tensile object. It acts to minimize its volume, and then it has some maximal supersymmetry. Now, uh, the dynamics of multiple membranes has proven to be much, much more elusive. And there's certainly a bunch of sentences that are used, and are no doubt true. Uh, so the first one, of course, is that there's no dilettante to enable a weakly coupled limit. The other ones that come up are these curious uh, facts that the number of degrees of freedom is supposed to scale like m to 3 halves for an m2 brain or n cubed for an m5 brain. Uh, and the last one is uh, no known Lagrangian description. Uh, but of course, that's the one that I'm going to challenge in this talk. And of course, uh, Juan's talk has uh, definitely uh, ch challenged that statement. Now, usually, of course, the reason why people say there's no, no, no Lagrangian description, well, there are sort of two reasons for that. The first is related to the fact that not only is there no dilaton, but one couldn't think of a small, a small coupling parameter that one could use to justify an action uh, principle. As Juan said, you could always multiply the action by a number and therefore make some kind of weak coupling limit. But actually, it turns out this level k, which can be related to an orbifold, will serve the purpose. The other reason I think that people said that there was no Lagrangian description uh, hmm. uh, was simply based on the fact that there was no known uh, theory in three dimensions with the right symmetries, namely 16 supersymmetries, or n equals 8, and an SO8 R symmetry. So there certainly is a theory with n equals 8 supersymmetry in three dimensions, that's supersymmetric Yang-Mills, maximal supersymmetric Yang-Mills. But we will definitely also uh, give an example of a theory in three dimensions with n equals 8 supersymmetry that is not super Yang Mills. So what will I talk about in this talk? So uh, you'll, you'll probably be pleased to know the introduction is already over, uh, although 25% of the talk is not over. I will then describe the uh, n equals 8 model uh, in some detail, and then I'll go on to discuss models with less supersymmetry, n equals 6. These, by and large, are the ABJM models, although not entirely. And then, of course, I'll end with some conclusions uh, with uh, some ideas of what needs to be done, what could be done, uh, and thoughts, and some random comments, of course, throughout the talk. So uh, one starts by considering a stack of a parallel M2 brains. So you've got eight scalars Xi, and their fermionic superpartners Psi. And psi's are distinguished by the fact that they're actually Goldstinos, so they satisfy some projector, uh, gamma not 1, 2, psi is minus psi. So the preserved supersymmetry satisfy gamma not 1, 2, epsilon is epsilon. So if you want to start constructing a theory for these guys, well, you just have to assume that they live in some vector space. So normally, in, 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 of course, for D brains, the scalar fields live in a Lie algebra. Well, if you just start writing down an ansatz for what the supersymmetry algebra is, you're pretty much led to this. The first line is more or less generic. 
uh, in any supersymmetric theory that I know of. The second line, well, the first term is just the free field example, and that's, of course, been known for a long time. It, 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 it's what goes into uh, the uh, Berkshire-Sesing-Townsend uh, model at lowest order. Well, then what do you write? Now, in supersymmetry, whatever you write in a, in a fermion variation on the right-hand side, more or less, if you have enough supersymmetry, it determines everything. So what can you possibly write here? And the answer is, I think you can really only write something like this. Now, why? It depends on what you assume, of course. One thing you might put as an ingredient is scale invariance, because the M2 brain is supposed to be conformal theory. So scale invariance tells you there has to be something cubic in the axis. Now, the other feature that comes about is that uh, psi and epsilon have opposite chiralities, so you need something that respects that. So you mean you have to have a gamma there with an odd number of indices. Uh, you could put gamma i, j, k, or you can put gamma i. And I'll tell you now, gamma i doesn't, doesn't work. Uh, so you're more left, left with that. And then you just have something which is a triple product. I mean, we don't, haven't said what it is. It's just denoted by the square brackets. So whatever this algebra is, it needs to have a triple product. And for lack of a better name, we've referred to those as three algebras. Now, the other important feature from this is you immediately find that if you look for the supersymmetry conditions of an M2 brain ending on an M5 brain, uh, you get the following BPS equation, which is of basically of the form written down by Basu and Harvey, and certainly uh, their paper was my main motivation for starting this, which was, you know, what theory could produce this BPS equation. And you can see that to get this equation, you, you do need two things uh, over here. You need that there's a triple product, obviously, and you need that there's gamma i, j, k, not gamma i. Okay. Well, the moral of supersymmetry, of course, is once you put that there, you have to deal with the consequences, and the consequences tell you everything. So the first consequence is to look at the closure of the algebra, and it closes onto a translation piece, which is, comes from the free part, and then it closes onto this. So if you did Yang-Mills theory, this would just have two x's, and you'd simply recognize it as a gauge transformation, saying that the x's were in the adjoint representation. Here, well, again, you just have to say it's some kind of gauge transformation. At first it seemed rather mysterious, but actually it's not at all, as you'll see. It's just a gauge transformation. So you have to learn to deal with this. Uh, and to do this, I'm going to introduce a bunch of generators for the algebra, TAs. And by definition, this is totally antisymmetric because it was soaked up with gamma i, j, k. So f's are totally antisymmetric. So, this symmetry here takes this form. Well, I need to gauge that because you see it's got <coughs> lambdas made of x's, and x's, of course, are space time dependent. So you gauge it by introducing a gauge field as you would have done in any course on gauge theory. So at this point, I should definitely mention the work of Andreas Gustafsson, who used a different uh, way of doing this, although it later turned out to be equivalent. Uh, and I can do it slightly before us. Now, the full supersymmetry algebra takes this form, and again, well, with the exception of that minus one six, which you find out in hindsight, uh, there's not much choice here. This is, I've already justified the first two lines. And the third line, well, you know, there really isn't much else you could put. And the magic is, of course, that this, this works. This closes on shell, provided these f's satisfy this identity, which is a generalization of the Jacobi identity, if you like it. And what the identity does is it ensures that these gauge symmetries we've discussed are actually the gauge symmetries of a Lie algebra. So in other words, you take the commutator, you get back a gauge transformation. Well, you can go ahead and you can construct an invariant Lagrangian, and it's of this Chern-Simons type, uh, the type that was discussed by Schwartz. Uh, except there are some important differences. You get this, what we called originally a twisted Chern-Simons term. Of course, it's, everybody knows now it's not twisted. It's just two different gauge groups at opposite level. Um, standard kinetic terms, uh, the f's determine a natural Yukawa term, and then there's a natural potential, which is what you expect, right? The, the variation of this, uh, the thing that appears in the variation of the uh, fermion squared. What do you need to construct this algebra, this, this action, of course, this Lagrangian, is you need trace, an invariant trace, an, an inner product on the algebra. You want to construct a number from your fields. <coughs> 
And gauge invariance implies that this f has to be totally antisymmetric uh, once you raise an index. So all of this, of course, is completely analogous to gauge theory where you have a three index object. And I've got this notation for what a tilde a is. I, just, I wouldn't concentrate too much on that. So here's the good news. Lo and behold, here you have a Lagrangian which has all the expected symmetries. So it's got n equals a supersymmetry, 16 supercharges, and SO8 R symmetry, and indeed it does have parity symmetry in it, which was a, a problem. So uh, that was worth a beer. Um, but then the, there was a result that actually, more or less, there's only one example of this. That's to say that if the trace is positive definite, uh, and you're looking at finite dimensionals, then uh, Basically, the unique solution is there's four generators, and f is just epsilon a, b, c, d, with some constant, which I've written as 2 pi over k. And I believe these authors were the first to show it. Uh, in that case, this one theory we have is just an SU2 times SU2 Chern Simons theory, or an SO4 theory, if you like. And the couple of matter is in the bifundamental representation. And of course, I've written k like this because the standard Chern Simons quantization rules tells you that k has to be an integer. And of course, that's the thing that appears that justifies the weak coupling limit. Or I should say, gives you a weak coupling limit. On the other hand, there are infinite dimensional examples. Uh, and you can take the Nambu bracket on some three manifold sigma. Uh, and I'll just mention that here because more recently people have been thinking about this. We mentioned it in one of our papers, but people have now saying that actually you can think of this as being an M5 brain uh, wrapped on R3 times sigma. And there's two papers about this. Well, there's more than two. Okay, so you have this one theory. It's, it, was, it was on your wish list in some sense. Uh, but what is its relationship to M theory? So this is my, my paper. Uh, with Dave Tong, and more or less the ne same, the next day, I think it was, uh, this group produced a paper with extremely overlapping results. Uh, but I think we basically agree. Uh, so the vacuum moduli space is of the form R8 times R8 mod D2K, where D is the dihedral group. So if you look at K equals 1, you get R8 mod Z2 times R8 mod Z2, at least in some parameterization. And that's nice because it's the moduli space of an SO4 gauge theory. Now, for k equals 2, you get a similar thing, but with next to z2. And that's the moduli space of an SO5 gauge theory, a three-dimensional <coughs> gauge theory. Now, you can pretty much imagine that this surely represents two objects living on R8 mod z2. Now, whether or not they're M2 brains or just something completely different, you could argue with. But certainly, it looks like two objects on R mod z2. Now, if you go look at what people expect in M theory, uh, so R8 mod Z2 is a maximally supersymmetric orbifold. In other words, the orbifold uh, projection doesn't project out anything more than what the M2 brains have. So you still expect 16 supersymmetries. Uh, and the gate, there are two types because there's two types of discrete torsion that you can have, mainly no torsion or one unit of torsion for the bulk four form. And that was noted by those at Sethi, Bakuts, uh, Kapustin. Now, okay, well for K equals one, we're sort of in trouble because you expect O4, not SO4. However, for k equals 2, we're in good shape. There's no contradiction at all. That's fine. Now, I didn't tell you on the other screen, but for k greater than 2, you just get R8 mod, R8 mod D2k, and in general, that doesn't look like anything too sensible. Uh, for example, the overfold action that you find, it, it moves the brains around in a very funny way. For example, it stretches the distances between them. Uh, Although it's a cute observation, actually this is primarily due to the other group, that for k equals 3, uh, you get the moduli space of G2 gauge theory. So you can go and scratch your head. I would like to mention one other th thing, uh, which is, I think, interesting. So if you go out on the Coulomb branch, uh, you can look for a mass formula. Now, I am emphasize this in green, in case you should have done it. Of course, it's a classical result. And this theory for small k, where you're most interested, is strongly coupled. So you'd have to take this with at least one grain of salt. And some people take it with an infinite number of grains of salt. Um, but we find that the mass is proportional to the area of a triangle whose vertices end on one of the M2s. So 
what we'd like to do is think of this in some way, and this is speculative, of course, is relationship to what you expect from D-brain physics, where, of course, you can look at the open string states between the D-brains, and the mass of these states is the length of the string that stretches between two D-brains. And here you're finding that whatever object that is that replaces it, it seems to have three prongs, it's a triangle, and it's proportional to the area. Well, one of the nice things is this, this orbifold I talked about, although it moves the brains around and changes the, the distances between them, it preserves this mass formula. Uh, the other nice thing about this mass formula is that if you imagine putting these triangles between M M5 brains, uh, you, you would naturally see an N cubed. And there's, a, there's another oddity about this, this formula, of course, uh, which is that you get massless states not when the brains are coincident, at least, you, of course, this is a classical discussion I emphasize again. Uh, not when the brains are coincident, but when they're collinear. So they could be very far apart. Uh, now, of course, I think in the quantum theory, this is, this is not a meaningful uh, issue because you have this enhanced gauge symmetry. And it's analogous to uh, what happens for D2 brains in M theory, where you have uh, the Coulomb branches R7. And if you go to the origin of R7, you, it looks like in string theory, you put all the D2 brains on top of each other. Um, <laughs> Uh, you get a strongly coupled gauge theory, the gauge group's completely unbroken. Now, you know from the N theory perspective, you can introduce some kind of non-abelian Wilson line and break up the D brains in the S1, separate them out in the S1. And in some sense, all that's happened here is that S1 has gone from being a circle to being to blowing up, getting big until it's a line. And so you see that when they're collinear, you get the enhanced gauge symmetry. But again, I emphasize this, this, this page is all classical. But I don't know, I think it's very provocative and I think it perhaps justifies further thought. Okay. So, um, moving on, it's obviously of, of great interest to try to generalize this Lagrangian construction. So I'll mention some things that have been done, uh, some briefly. So the first one is to note that the equations of motion uh, uh, don't require that F is totally antisymmetric. And here you can construct infinitely many examples. So this was pointed out by a Swedish group. Now, the, the, the objection you would have for that, or I would have, is that this, without uh, a metric, there's no gauge invariant trace, and you'd be worried about constructing observables. But nevertheless, you know, I guess one can still keep an open mind about these things. And now, another big industry or, has been the fact that uh, you can have H be degenerate, uh, so not have a positive... Uh, definite structure. So in the Lorentzian structure in particular, it's proved to be proposed by these three groups. And there's been quite a lot of work on that, and I'm not really going to discuss it uh, here. I will say, of course, that you, you would have thought this was crazy, but it's not as crazy as you might first have thought. And it looks like you can deal with the apparent non-unitarity, although whether or not it just becomes superior males or not is, is, is a question that's not clear. So I'm just going to say that the status of these models is not yet clear. I think it's clear where the general uh, field has gone, and, and that's the paper of Aharoni, Bergman, Jeffries, and Malsena, which we heard about from Juan about an hour ago. So from this perspective, you just look for less supersymmetry. And n equals 6 is the next one down the line. Uh, of course, that's still quite a lot. That's 12 supercharges, so that's, that's somewhere between n equals 2 and n equals 4 in four dimensions, four-dimensional counting. Well, what they proposed are churn simons matter theories with gauge groups UN cross UN for any N and level K. And they proposed and gave very, very good evidence for the fact that these describe NM2 brains on RN mod ZK. And miraculously, this involves K equals 1 and also K equals 2, where you expect N equals 8. Although, well, Juan has mentioned all this stuff earlier. And, of course, the great benefit here is that you get a large N and K limit, and hence you can do ADS CFT such in particular, it is four cross CP3 in string theory. So uh, again, this is what Juan mentioned. I won't go on about it. Uh, and again, there's been a more recent paper uh, by those authors, which is generalized to the case of discrete caution, which I briefly mentioned, with where you just simply replace the gauge groups. One curious thing is uh, this includes this R8 mod Z2 SO5 overfold that is the candidate for what the N equals 8 theory describes. But of course, they don't have manifest n equals 8. So it's a, it's, it's a curious state of affairs as to whether or not these two theories are dual to each other or whether one of them doesn't really describe M2 brains on R8 mod Z2. 
Okay. So what I wanted to do here is to go back to this discussion that uh, John and I had worked on as to derive the most general um, scale invariant Lagrangian. So scale invariant is important here. You can add mass terms. Um, and not go for SO8, but to go for SU4 times U1. Um, so you, you have your scalars which are now complex, and so they sit in a 4 of SU4 with some U1 charge, and you have the fermions which are complex in the opposite, well, you can raise and lower, but uh, there's a downstairs A index which means they're in the uh, 4 bar of SU4, and then you've got supersymmetries which are in the 6 of SU4, and they're sort of real with that reality condition. And of course, complex complication uh, raises or lowers the A index and flips the U1 charge. So, you can start from the most general form of the supersymmetries. Um, and I claim that once you do the closure, you're left with this. So I wouldn't worry too much about the, the, the details. You can certainly look at our paper. Uh, more or less, it has a very similar form. It's all controlled by this F. Uh, and F has to satisfy this kind of identity now, which is a generalization of that previous fundamental identity, and it's generalized in the following way. That the symmetry properties of F are now the following. It's antisymmetric in the first two, it's antisymmetric in the last two, and then when you interchange the left and right, you, that's the complex conjugation. So it's certainly not generically totally antisymmetric. So in our way of thinking, this, this again determines some kind of triple product, uh, it's not totally antisymmetric, but that's okay. Uh, so we've denoted it with a, a semicolon here. Uh, so it's totally antisymmetric in X and Y, but not in Z. And again, the key, key thing is that the whole theory is determined by specifying these Fs. So in other words, specifying a triple product. And again, you can construct a Lagrangian. Uh, I just want to show you it's got a very similar form. Uh, this epsilon is just some complicated cubic that you square. Uh, there's the twisted chain Simon's term. Here are Yukawa's. Uh, and then there's free terms, kinetic terms. So our, our claim is that if you're looking for n equals 6 scale invariant SU4, then, well, then this is what it has to look like with uh, this, this other fundamental identity, uh, which I've written there. Okay, so of course you know you're going to do better because you already know that the ABJM models exist. Uh, so here you find an infinite class of three algebras. Uh, and here's one nice class, construct as follow. So, so let's consider the space of linear maps between two complex vector spaces, V1 and V2, with dimensions N1 and N2. Then you can just take this bracket. It's a natural thing to do. Um, and you can check that it satisfies all the required properties of this so-called fundamental identity. Uh, and indeed, if you put it into the Lagrangian I just gave you, you'll get the Lagrangians of ABJM. Uh, and also ABJ. So here you see the gauge symmetry is generated by the triple product. And it works as follows. That the delta X is just XM times minus MX. So M1 and M2 are completely different. In fact, they live in different spaces in general. And so you, X, of course, is a bifundamental field, and you're doing right multiplication and left multiplication uh, by separate gauge transformations. And the whole point, the raison d'etre, if you like, of the fundamental identity is that you have sort of covariance, that a, a variation of the derivation property, under variation of this, you get this product back. So I think I already mentioned that yeah, in this case, you get the ABJM models, and of course, you even get the, AB, the ABJ models. Uh, now, there was quite a lot of uh, activity around the time that these, well, certainly the time that my paper came out, uh, several other papers, different things. So there are definitely other possibilities here. Of course, you can do SUN cos SUN. Uh, one already mentioned that. Uh, you can, there's a curious one of SP2 times O2. These are the gauge groups uh, of these authors. Uh, and then there was a paper by Schnabel and, and Takikawa who, who uh, classified uh, all the possible solutions. And, and uh, I think more or less this is it. And I also wanted to mention these other papers. Okay. So 
what are the conclusions from this talk? So what we constructed was, and it turns out to be rather unique, it's not entirely unique, of course we have this parameter k, uh, and if you allow for loosening of the constituations like uh, the metric or positive definiteness, then there's infinitely many, but it's an n equals a three-dimensional Lagrangian field theory with all the symmetries you want of M2 brains. Um, so the pluses are that. Uh, it, it's also, just from, if you like a historic perspective, it's a new maximum superconformal to Simon's theory. It's not Yang-Mills. So it's the, I believe it's the only example of an N equals a maximally supersymmetric theory that is not Yang-Mills theory. Of course, with the Lagrangian formulation. Uh, so in terms of M-theory interpretation, it currently stands, you'd have to identify it with two M2 brains on R8 mod Z2, and this is only crystal clear for K equals 2. On the other hand, if you just go down to N equals 6, then there are infinitely many examples. Uh, these are the ABJM and the ABJ models, as well as a few other types. And here one has a, comp uh, a complete wish list, if you like, for effective actions for M2s on these backgrounds. Uh, and in particular, the k equals 1 and k equals 2, of course, the drawback is, as mentioned, that there's, there's no, you don't see the n equals 8 supersymmetry um, manifestly. Well, what I'd like to think that we've done to some extent is to gain some insight into the degrees of freedom of multiple M2 brains. And I would, this is this classical point about the massive states are associated to these triangles. So, uh, there are many issues to understand. Uh, this is just a few. The first one is, what is the role of this n equals 8 theory? So, okay, maybe you buy that for k equals 2, but what about the other values of k? Uh, I would still bet that it has something to do with m-theory. Uh, I think a big open problem is to fully understand the enhancement of the ABJM models at k equals 1 and 2. Another one is to understand these Lorentzian models, which I have not discussed. So, of course, there are various statements in literature which are some of is equivalent to n equals 8 super Yang Mills uh, if you do a gauging procedure to get rid of the, unit, uh, the negative modes. Uh, it's also been related to M2 D2s on the cylinder. And there's also a paper relating it to scaling models of ABJM. So I, I, I'm not going to give any details of this, just that there are lots of ideas out there that need exploring. Another one, of course, is can you see this n to three halves? Uh, again, there are some ideas that have appeared in the literature about it. So my final transparency is the, is the following question. So I've tried to stress the central role of three algebras in this work. So why? Um, so a lot of people say to me, well, you know, this, these are just gauge theories, churn simons gauge theories. You don't need this language. And that's true. There's no doubt that's true. But why have uh, I continued to, to do this? Well, the first is they, they are naturally encoding all the information of the theory, right? So, in some sense, this is semantics, but the, the data of what these Chern Simons theories are is the data of what we call a three algebra. Right? So, classification of these theories is classification of three algebras. Another point for me, is, especially because uh, when we wrote the first paper, we didn't have the gauge theory at all, um, is that the, you know, the dynamics of M2 brains, if you just think of the classically, well, it's primarily determined by the scalars and fermions. The, uh, the gauge, theory is not, the gauge field is non-dynamical. Uh, and these scalars and fermions don't directly see a Lie bracket. That's, right? I mean, if you, you can, of course, try to construct three algebras out of Lie brackets, uh, but that's not directly. So the, the sort of the more important concept, if you like, is perhaps this, this three bracket. And then my final statement to close off the talk is that I hope that, uh, and I know at least one person, apart from my mother, who thinks that these are uh, very are quite interesting, and I would hope that maybe that they are a clue to some of the microscopic degrees of freedom in M theory, uh, such as an analog of the open string states. So thank you very much. <laughs>